Well, good evening, everyone. I know it's not uh, quite Sabbath yet, but it's might be for some people. And uh, uh, we're continuing to study on uh, the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. And this is the last of Joan's studies in 1893. And uh, next week, we're going to give a bit of historical background uh, before we get into the 1895 General Conference for Wilson's. So <clears throat> I'm going to try to put some spirit of prophecy statements about, about um, what was happening in 1895, just kind of give us a background. Now, um, so anyway, before we begin on all this, I want you to join me in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the Sabbath, the hours that are approaching, and um, we are thankful for this past week, for the difficulties and trials uh, that reveal to us our defects in character and show us our de dependence upon you. We know, Lord, that your heart must break as you look at this world of sin, as you look at our lives and you see the pain and suffering that sin has caused. And I know you long to be with us in your kingdom. You long to have these things come to an end. But your divine patience continues to plead for humanity, continues to plead for us. And we are thankful for that. We give our hearts to you each morning and each afternoon and each evening, each moment. We ask, Lord, that you can help us uh, to represent you aright in our words and our actions. And we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can work not just upon our hearts, but upon the hearts of those we come in contact with. And that your angels um, can guide and protect us as we go through this world. We're thankful for the Sabbath, the blessings that we receive in study, in fellowship, in prayer. And we just pray, Lord, that each person who is searching for truth, who is seeking to develop a Christ-like character, can be drawn close to you, can be comforted, can know your presence, can know your peace, in spite of what's happening in the world around. Help us to enter into your rest and to cease from our own works. As Christ did when he created this world and rested. We ask, Lord, that um, you can be with us now in this study as we read. And we pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good, e good evening again, everyone. Now. Um, this, this series here, this, that Jones did, this is the last one. And he started off talking about, um, first the Holy Spirit, the need of the Holy Spirit. And then he went through some of the, uh, the political things that were happening in regards to the Sunday with the Chicago World's Fair. And, um, uh, he was laying out basically the principle that many Adventists are not really Sabbath keepers, they're Saturday keepers. That is, he's, he's connecting the three angels' messages uh, to not just about keeping a day of the week, but about righteousness by faith, showing that the Sabbath is a sign and seal of righteousness by faith. And that in order to keep the Sabbath, we have to enter into God's rest. And, and then he starts to build the prophetic picture about how God sees things compared to how we see things. He compares uh, the false message of righteousness by faith that's first seen in the Catholic Church, but also seen in Adventism. 
at that time. Um, and, and then he gives us some messages that uh, show how God is going to accomplish this work um, of righteousness by faith in his people. So he's, he's laid out all kinds of studies here in this, you know, in 23 studies. Now, in this one, of course, it's going to be the last study. He's going to sum up some of these things, and he's going to bring us even to some of the immediate things that were happening right then and regarding to Sunday. Now, one of the things, you know, I've been an Adventist since 82, and of course, through the 80s and the 90s, um, Adventists are always looking for the signs that this Sunday law is going to be imminent. So we'd be looking at either what the Catholic Church is doing, what the papacy is doing, what the, the Protestant churches are doing. And um, to some degree, you know, we would be looking at the Illuminati or different groups like that, the Jesuits, and how they're connected with Freemasons or things like that. Um, trying to, to figure out what's going to happen, right? This is how we generally would look at how we prepare for the Sunday law. If we, we know what's happening, then we're not going to be deceived. But this is really much more about character than it is about knowledge of events. And, and Jones is quite clear. However, we think it's going to happen. It's not going to happen that way. And, and one of the struggles that we have faced as Adventists, in general, Jeff faced this prior to 9-11, and as people in this movement after 9-11, is really trying to understand what's going on in this world. I mean, we know what Ellen White says in The Great Controversy, as we're going to look at it right here. Um, but often what we're focused on is external things outside of us rather than what's going on inside of us. And now sometimes we will look at what the church is doing or what other people are doing. Uh, but we're not focused upon uh, the characteristics of of what it would mean to have, you know, the mark of the beast, for instance. You know, people think it's some kind of you know, tattoo or chip or whatever. And, and obviously that can't be the case because the Sunday law could have happened in the past. But anyway, uh, when we go through this, this study, and we should be able to get through it all at uh, in, in one study. Um, and then, as I said uh, before we started, uh, before we prayed there, um, that we're going to be looking at um, some of the history dealing with the 1895 General Conference. So one of the things that happens with Jones, and, and we're trying to understand not just the message, but how the message got to where it is in the church. And when I say the church, I'm not just talking about what we consider the, the liberals and, and so forth, but even within so-called conservative Adventism, that there's a lack of experience when it comes to righteousness by faith. People have all kinds of theories. Some of them are correct. People have understanding. Some of them are correct. Some of them are truth mixed with error. Um, but what we're really interested in is having this experience that God has laid out for us in his word and um, getting caught up in thinking things correctly is not always the answer. I mean, there is, it's important to understand things correctly. But we can understand things correctly, but still be completely wrong. So anyway, we're going to get into this study here. So Joan says, we will begin with that passage that we had last night in volume four. It is on page 443 of the canvassing edition of the Great Controversy. To learn what the image is like and how it is to be formed, we must study the characteristics of the beast itself, the papacy. And we need to study this now just as much as we ever have needed to study it because not all the features of the image of the beast have as yet been developed. So keep that in mind. 
Uh, the image is not yet appeared before the world in all its features and in all its developments. Each step that is to be taken and all that is to be done from this time forward will be the appearance of successive features of the image, creating more and more the full likeness, the perfect likeness in all its parts of the original. Only the start has been taken now, but as we have found in our lessons here, the start which has been taken is such that no power on earth or anywhere else can stop it. It will go on and develop all that is in it in spite of all that can be done to prevent it. It will go on even against the wishes and many times contrary to the intentions of those who have started it. So Jones presents something quite remarkable, really, if you think about it. Um, very prescient in that um, here Jones recognized that this is a start of something. Now, I don't think he imagines how long it's going to take. But often when we look at, at, at this movement, we understand that the Sunday law began at least at 9-11, that we're in the time of the Sunday law. We saw events just as Jones did in his time that showed that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down. And so Jones is in a line that is including the Sunday law. But yet, it's the start of something. And, you know, we, of course, are repeating Millwright history. Um, particularly, we're repeating the parable of the ten virgins, because that is going to, has been fulfilled and will be fulfilled to the very letter. And so we have experienced that. And I think it is necessary for anyone who is going to be ready for the Sunday law to have apprehended and participated in of the first and second angels' messages. That is, we can't depend upon someone else's experience in those messages. If, if you have not um, accepted and experienced the first and second angels' messages, you can't experience the third angels' message. And this has been a problem within Adventism, is that we focused upon what Jones has said and Alan White has said about the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity. And, and we understand that that doesn't mean that the third angel's message is the only part of righteousness by faith out of all three messages. Because all three messages, the first and the second and the third, are all righteousness by faith. But the third angel, in verity, that means in experience, in reality, it's something now apprehended. It's something that we are a part of. Righteousness by faith has completed its work, so to speak, in the acceptance and experience of the third angel. But that can't occur without the righteousness by faith aspects being experienced in the first and the second messages. So the first and the second messages are just as much righteousness by faith as the third is. It's just that the third isn't about a theory. It's about an experience. And here, when we see what Jones is talking about here, the image of the beast, we know that the image of Christ is being developed in his people and will be seen in his people, just as the image of the beast is really going to represent the character of the papacy, which is really the character of Satan. So we have these two contrasts, these two groups of people. The everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message that develops and demonstrates two classes of worshipers. And so that's what we are seeing here. Now, Jones understands that we don't even really know what this is yet, but it's going to develop. We don't fully understand how it's going to develop, but in order to understand its development, we need to understand the past. And, and, and that's not just so that we know what's going to happen in the future. It's so that we can learn from the experiences of the past. Now, just to see how this thing has grown with us, how it has grown right before our eyes. Several years ago, when we first began real 
direct active work upon this particular phase, we established the American Sentinel. That is eight years ago now, I think. There was then only one organization in the country that was set to obtain this thing. In a little while, that organization gathered to itself others, and within a year or two, it had gathered four or five. And then the movement got beyond the management and really beyond the power of the original organization. Then the original organization itself dropped out of our minds entirely, and this new mold was put upon it. This increased power that was given to it carried it beyond the original organization by those that were added to it. That was what our opposition was against then. It was this new form that we had to deal with. Um, so what he's talking about here is the established American Sentinel. Um, and there's all these organizations that were seeking to bring about uh, the Sunday law. And so at this time, they were, the American Sentinel was a, a periodical that Jones uh, and others put together uh, to show what was happening in the area of religious liberty. So it's, it's basically the precursor to Liberty Magazine. Um, so he says, now the increased power that has been brought to by these additional organizations has carried itself and the whole movement to the place where the original organization intended it to go, so that now we have no more to deal with these organizations. We have nothing to do with them particularly anymore. Our contention is not against them or their work. We have now to deal with the government of the United States, and these things are, I was going to say, merely incidents. But they are less than that because the government will take steps and will be forced to take steps that will be directly against the intentions and many times against the power of those who have done what has been done. And whereas our first work was against the first, that first organization, and as our second work was against the increased organization and the work that was, it was doing, now all these organi those organizations are out of the way. And we have now to deal with that which has been done by them. That is our position now. That is where we stand. And whether the American Sabbath Union does this, that, or the other, it is nothing to us now because steps will be taken and things that will be done that the American Sabbath Union never did intelligently or conscious, consci consciously intend. So what he's saying is these organizations, they began this Consciously. Conscientiously, yes. Uh, these organizations were... Um, you know, seeking to promote Sunday, right? But things, from Jones, Jones' point of view, they got out of hand. It wasn't really even their original intention uh, to get the state involved in it. It's just how these different organizations came about and began to work in promoting Sunday became a political thing. Uh, things will be done against the wishes and beyond the intent, the conscious intent, of the whole combination, because they, even in their most radical intent, never intended anything but that they themselves should manage the government when they got it. But behold, the Catholics will manage the government after these have got it. And that is where they will find themselves left in the fog. That is where they will find themselves at a disadvantage. And things will be done in spite of them that they never thought of when they were blinded by their own zeal to get power that did not belong to them but they have nobody to blame but themselves. So he's saying here that they were seeking to get laws regarding protecting Sunday, but they never realized that this is leading to the Catholics, right? So now if we're gonna to try to make a comparison with Jones Day and, and our time either prior to 9-11 or even after, um, what we can say is that these, these movements, um, people aren't always aware of what it is they're trying to accomplish or what is going to be accomplished by their actions. <clears throat> and we can say this even with what I think is going to happen to some degrees, that we're going to see a backlash against wokeism and so forth uh, happening in America. And Oh, yeah. Um, and many of the people who... Uh, you know, speak of liberty today and freedom of speech and freedom of conscience and all those things in the Constitution will, 
even though they don't intend it, they will see that that constitution uh, will not be regarded when the backlash occurs. And, and we've seen this type of thing happen before. So, um, yeah, so we know that that this world, unless you're controlled by the spirit of Christ and you're seeking to be Christ-like and you're uh, seeking to obey God, um, you're connected to the world. And many Christians in their politics are really just connected to the world. So they, they're seeking to the, the power of the state to help them in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases. Uh, so, so they'll have nobody to blame but themselves. Now, Congress has adjourned, and the action which that Congress took is fastened upon the government without any remedy. Not only that, but an additional step was taken in that line in the very last days of the session. I've not found the full particulars of the outcome yet, but I know the facts, and, that, and they are these. It was found that the inaugural ball that was to be held celebrating Cleveland's inauguration had to be held Saturday night. It was expected, of course, that they would dance over beyond 12 o'clock in the night. The Marine Band, the National Band of the United States, was employed. They were to furnish the music for the ball and were also to give concerts on Sunday following. The ministers of Washington City sent up a petition to Congress, and Senator Quay, of course, presented it. And here are the particulars of that that are reported on that. So um, somebody might want to note the date. Look at biblical date or any other things, but it's February 28, 1893. Mr. Quay presented in the Senate today a petition signed by the pastors of many of the Washington churches and others on the subject of the proposed concert by the Marine Band in the pension office building next Sunday as part of the inaugural ceremony. I don't know how that was. Uh, this is the petition. Um, Mr. Quay, I present a petition of 60 clergymen of the city of Washington which I asked to have read. So that's Mr. Quay saying that. The vice president says, the petition will be read if there's no objection. Uh, the chief clerk says, the petition is as follows. To the president of the United States, the secretary of the interior, and the Senate and House representatives in Congress assembled, a petition. Whereas it having been announced by the inaugural committee through the daily papers, that as part of the program for the inaugural ceremonies, three concerts by the Marine Band are to be held in the pension office building on Sunday, March 5th, approximately. And whereas the Congress of the United States, in deference to the Christian sentiment of the nation, clearly and unmistakably expressed by the religious press, the pulpit, and by petition, has by legal enactment closed the doors of the Columbian Exposition on Sunday. Therefore, Believing to permit the holding of such concerts on Sunday by a band of musicians connected with one of the great departments of the government in a government building which is occupied by another great department and as a part of the ceremonies connected with the inauguration of the president of this great Christian nation by and with the sanction of her chosen rulers would be a national sin. Believing also that such desecration as proposed is unprecedented would result in incalculable harm and would be used as an authority and example for the complete secular, secularization of Sunday. We earnestly petition that orders be issued forbidding the use of any government building for such purpose on that day, signed by a number of people there. So you see, the Senate passed a resolution in answer to that petition complying with its request so far as to ask the sec Secretary of the Interior for information. I've seen by a later paper in giving the report of the outcome, the statement that the Secretary of the Interior had ordered that the Marine Band should not play on Sunday and that President Cleveland had signified his wish to the same effect. Therefore, when 12 o'clock struck Saturday night, the band just stopped short, the great brilliant electric lights were turned off, and everybody on the floor stopped dancing. And what I call attention to that for is for you to see 
But the government, the United States Senate at least, has taken an additional step in support of Sunday by passing that res resolution and there it stands. Now, another thought, that case that was in the Judge Tully's court in Chicago, in which the steamboat companies thought to enjoin the World's Fair commissioners from shutting Jackson Park to steamboat excursionists on Sunday, that failed. And Judge Tully decided that the United States government had sole authority in the park for exposition purposes. And it had stated that Sunday should be observed there that shut out the state of Illinois and the city of Chicago from any word on the matter. So then you see everything that touches this question, everything that comes up, all is turned to the support of what has been done. Now, if no extra session of Congress is called and none has been yet, and doubtless will not now be now as the president has not signified his intention to do it, then that legislation goes on without any question or interference until the World's Fair is ended and the thing for which the act was passed has been accomplished. Then we shall have the United States government committed to, and having lived through more than a year's history under the present statutory Sunday law, and thus the precedent will have been established, which will be a part of the experience of the government, a part of its history. And as men who are not statesmen, very few are nowadays, especially in Congress, are governed more by what has been done than by what ought to be done. That will be the strongest argument and the great bulwark forever after in favor of Sunday as the sac sacred day of the government of the United States. But as we have said formerly, if an extra session should be called and another Congress repeal the Sunday law, that would not affect the principle involved in the Sunday legislation in the least because any succeeding legislation can repeal any law passed by any previous legislature, and such action does not call in question uh, the right of the previous legislature to enact that which has been repealed. When a legislature repeals an act of a previous legislature, it does not call in question the right of the previous legislature to enact it, but simply the policy of it. The right to do the thing is just the same as though it were not repealed. Consequently, if an extra session should be called and should repeal the Sunday Closing Act, the government would just be just as clearly committed and pledged to the principle that Sunday legislation is right on the government as it is now. Voice. Suppose they repeal it on constitutional grounds. Jones. If Congress should repeal it expressly upon the statement and for the reason that it was unconstitutional entirely, that would affect it, but a very little more because it would be simply the opinion of one Congress against the opinion of another, as is often done between the great parties. Even now, this is precisely the position of the two great parties on the tariff question. The Democratic Party insists that the Republican tariff bill is unconstitutional. Therefore, if this Sunday legislation should not be repealed bodily because it is unconstitutional. Any succeeding Congress could take it up again because Congress did that once before. So it would throw the thing into an even going controversy. And that is all there would be to it. But nothing that can be done can obliterate the legislation entirely, the principle of the thing and the right of the government to carry it forward. The fact is that the government is so thrown into the hands of this hierarchy that it never can be delivered. Controversies will arise, and as soon as the Catholics begin to launch ahead a little and show their strength, the professed Protestants will resent it. We may expect that at any time, we may look for it to come from any direction and from almost any source. It will certainly come. And as a matter of fact, it has already started. When the World's Fair buildings were dedicated, the Catholics, Cardinal Gibbons, and the representative of the Pope there received great honors. And because of that, quite a number of the professed Protestants, the preachers got into a great half about it. They said they would not have anything to do with the fair anymore. They declared if the Catholics are to have precedence and they are to receive the honors and all this, why, we'll just simply not have anything more to do with the fair. Well, the Catholics don't care for that. They have got the honor and they will have the power. And if Protestants don't like it, 
All they need to do is stay away. And by their staying away, they will give the Catholics that much more to do what they wanted to do in the first place. So the sum of the matter is that if they stay away, that gives the Catholics that much more power. And if they go, it is a recognition of the Catholic supremacy. And thus they are taken captive. And all they can do is be moved about by that power at its will. That's all they can do. Now, you know, we're reading this here. Of course, this is history in the past. And we could look at this and say, well, you know, the world has changed quite a bit. I mean, the Protestants, churches, don't have the kind of power that they had. Even the kind of power that they had, you know, in the 1990s, um, when we were looking for the moral majority, um, the evangelicals, uh, who were actively seeking, like it was in Jones Day, uh, to have the power of the state um, support, you know, that this would be a Christian nation and all of these things. They weren't talking so much about the Sunday. But you know, we know that the world has changed quite a bit since the 1990s. I mean, one of the things that, that I find difficult, and we've talked about this before, is that, you know, the Protestants, not are they not only just no longer Protestants, I mean, they're hardly even anything close to any kind of Christians. Um, they're very woke. Um, they're very, very liberal. And the fall, when Ella White talks about the Protestants' fall that happened in the, um, you know, 1844, um, when they became part of Babylon, she says that that fall continues and it reaches, because that was just a partial fall, but the sins that, that will continue to grow within the Protestant churches. That's the thing that I find really remarkable. And I don't quite know how to, how to look at it other than that there must have to be a type of I don't know. I don't know how you could have a a reform from all of these things. Um, but something has to happen. So what it is, I'm not sure. But it's just we have such a different situation than what existed then. Um, and so much so that, you know, when we're looking at a Sunday law, we're often looking at, well, it's going to be an environmental Sunday law. It's going to be about the green movement. But that's not what the Bible teaches. It has to be a religious Sunday law. It can't just be a Sunday law where they happen to make, for environmental reasons, uh, you know, Sunday the day of rest. That that wouldn't fulfill the prophecy. So there's got to be something more that we we have to see, and it's development. So even in Jones Day, that the development, the unfolding of this Sunday laws, obviously had just started, but how it's going to develop that is something that we don't fully, we don't see it yet. There is just one thing that they can do. They can escape the whole thing and be delivered from it if they will. But the only way they can do it is to accept the third angel's message. There's no other way out. These men, many of them, have been led into this by not seeing what was in it. They have been led into this by the influence of ministers who have a higher standing than they in the denominations roundabout, never dreaming what was in it. When they see that they are caught in a perfect labyrinth, and the further they go in it, and whichever way they turn, they get lost. When they see that, and how completely they have allowed themselves to be sold, they will deliver themselves by fleeing unto God. And that is why the Lord lifts his people up above the world, and causes his church to shine so that we cannot be hid. And when they begin to look for deliverance, they will see where deliverance is. Because in the third angel's message, God has set deliverance before the world. And a city set upon a hill cannot be hid. Now this point, of course, about the third angel's message. So one of the things this movement is taught is that... Um, you know, primarily this movement was raised up to give the message to Seventh-day Adventists. But we know there are many true Protestants in the world. And one, uh, this goes back like 2015, 
uh, when I wrote Jeff um, an email asking about um, when the joining of the two sticks happens. And he says that this happens uh, basically between midnight and the midnight cry. And the joining of the two sticks, my understanding of this is that this is the Protestants who join with Adventists um, prior to the Sunday law. So Jones would be talking about this, that there are Protestants who, where they, when they see where this is tending, will join with the third angel's message. Now, if we think about, um, and I don't know if all of you know this, but the, the present quarterly, uh, or the quarterly that's coming up, uh, I guess it would be this week, but the week after, is, is called Three Cosmic Messages, the Adventist Quarterly, because we were at church last Sabbath. And uh, that's the new quarterly that's going to be about the three angels' messages. It's written, I believe, by uh, uh, the evangelist for it is written. I can't think of his name. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, Adventists talk about the, the three angels' messages. And I haven't, and I'm going to look through the quarterly because I'm Mark Finley. Yes, thank you. Um, because, you know, I'm curious about how they understand the three angels' messages. Now, on my academia site, I have all my papers. The most read of my papers is, is not really a paper I wrote. It's uh, the three angels' messages source book. Um, lots of Adventists from all over the world uh, are interested in the three angels' messages. And I expect um, with this quarterly coming up, that uh, that uh, book will be um, uh, searched a little bit more than it would have been in, at previous times. So, and, and I can see where people, um, which parts of the world people are coming from when they're looking it up. And, and if they're university people, I can see which universities. So I see a lot of Adventist universities and so forth. Sometimes uh, your your academia site that you're talking about. Yeah, so I have an analytical thing that I get, so I can see what's happening with the papers. So it's yeah, easy familiar. to see what's happening. But but when we think about the three angels' messages and the, and the third angel's message in particular, I mean we know it. It's about righteousness by faith and the Sunday law. It's the Sabbath Sunday controversy, um, and that is going to be something that. There needs to be a clear messages on because these are three angels messages, but these messages are not just something that people get in a book. Right. I mean, they're part of an experience that that we go through. And, and these messages are given not by angels, but by God's people and they're, they're prophetic messages. So there's a lot we still as Seventh-day Adventists, don't understand about the three angels' messages. And one, of course, is how they were fulfilled in Millerite history. So it's interesting that the Millerites themselves never really understood that they were giving the first angel's message or the second angel's message. Um, it wasn't until 1844, well, maybe even a little bit before, when they started to look at uh, the messages about Babylon has fallen, um, the third, and also the Revelation 18, because they were calling people out of Babylon. But of course, that's Revelation 18. Um, and that that message doesn't really happen in the right history. At least it's not placed correctly if you're calling people out of Babylon um, under the second angel or, or under the second angel's message, right? So the fourth angel's message, which is Revelation 18, is really just the second angel's message. And, and Ellen White's quite clear, quite is quite clear that that is relating to the complete fall of the Protestant churches and this call out of Babylon. So the Millerites quite didn't quite understand it. And it took time even for uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church to understand the third angel's message. So 
they didn't seem to quite understand, you know, definitely when they were giving the first angel's message, that they were giving the first angel's message. It just wasn't part of their, um, their message. They weren't talking about the three angels' messages or the message of Revelation 18. Um, so we, we, when we studied in um, examining the foundation, we went through Millerite history. I mean, it, it was quite interesting to see what things they understood and what things they couldn't even perceive. And, and this is one of them. But now Adventists do ha have not this, they have very little idea about uh, the first and second and third angels messages where they are in history and definitely don't understand their repetition. So we know a city set on, on it, upon a hill cannot be hid. And that is what we are seeking to do. That is what this movement is about, what Adventism is about, to give a message to the world. And that message, of course, will be seen upon us. God's glory will be seen upon us. Now, when God lifts us up, sets us up on a high mountain, as it were, and causes his light to radiate in every direction, then people in every direction will see it. And when they find that they are so badly lost where they are, they will be glad to get deliverance from any source. They will be glad to see that it is God that will deliver in this direction. And they would rather have God than the papacy, even if they have to come to Seventh-day Adventists to find him. They will do it. Then another thing, this church congress, this World's Fair auxiliary that was dedicated or rather inaugurated at the dedication ceremonies, Archbishop Ireland was the grand magnet and the one orator, and it was opened up with the sanction and the blessing and goodwill of the Catholic Church. And in this, we begin with, as well as in the ceremonies of the fairgrounds, the Catholics, by the prominence that was given them, simply compelled these same Protestant ministers to say, well, if the Catholics are going to run the whole thing, we will not be there. Now, this was the thing that um, uh, we referred to um, at the beginning of these studies. This was these statements about, um, uh, where is it here? Cal Brother Caldwell, right? So there was this Brother Caldwell, and he's going to talk about this. So I'm just going to see if I can find this. Um, Brother Stanton and Caldwell, they were at this general conference and um, they sent a message here. So let me see if I'm going to find this. having trouble finding it. Uh, okay, so there's the telegram. And, and so here's what the telegram said. So this is the telegram from Brother Caldwell. When the former rain came, devout men, all nations there, Isaiah 66, 18, 19, Chicago Fair dedicated May 14, greatest number of devout men present. Their sacred year began April 16, first month closes May 16, last. Joel 2, 23, people asleep for the love of Jesus. Joel 1, 14, uh, Zephaniah 2, 1, 2, 1 to 3, and answer good or bad quick. So he sends this. Uh, to um, Ellen White, right? So this is a, a telegram sent to Ellen White. So, and the reason we found this is because it mentions the Chicago World's Fair. So now it's not true that from anything that we could find that it was dedicated on May 16th or, or on April 16th, pardon me, or April, let me see here, let me see, May 14th. Um, and we have no evidence that... Um, because if we look at that year, 
Um, so this is going to be, uh, what year is, are they dedicating the World's Fair? I thought it was 1890. No, it's not 1890. No, I wasn't trying to share around. I was just reading it. Um, so it's going to be, um, they called it the World's Columbian Exposition, right? And it's going to, they, it was in 1893. Uh, there were 27,300,000 visitors uh, to the fair. Um, it opened on May 1st, 1893, and closed October 30th, 1893. So they run it for, um, it's May, June, July, August, September, six months. I think it's 183 days or something like that. Um, <clears throat> um, so it starts on May 1st, and I know nothing about, I, I couldn't find anything, maybe somebody could find something else about it, about this April 14th date. So this is going to be in 1893, and then in, if we look in 1893, um, and we look at the first day of the first month, that's going to be um, on the biblical calendar. It's going to be April 18th, so not April 16th. Obviously, uh, the rabbinic calendar in this year it happens to be a month earlier, right? So Nisan 1 ends up being uh, prior to the equinox, which it wouldn't be. So they're going to have uh, the first day of the first month on um uh, the rabbinic calendar on uh, March March 18th, right? So it's a couple of days before um, the spring equinox. So the biblical calendar doesn't start before the spring equinox. And um, so none of this really seems to match up uh, with uh, with what uh, Brother Caldwell was saying. So we don't have any record of this dedication. Now, what he's trying to argue here, if you look up these verses, um, uh, so that's going to be um, so the verses that he had. Here, I'll share the screen so you can see this here. <clears throat> so this is the right here is this. Right, he's going to say the verses that he puts are out are Joel two twenty three. So that that one particularly. So Joel two twenty three, and we'll be familiar with it. <clears throat> be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for He hath given you the former rain moderately, and He will cause down cause to come down for you the rain the former rain and the latter rain in the first month now how he's reading this what is it how is he reading this passage why, why is he referring to the first month on the Jewish calendar and this dedication of uh, at the Sh Chicago World's Fair. Why does he bring up this verse, Joel 2, verse 23? Do you understand his reasoning? He says, when the former rain came, devout men, all nations there, right? Isaiah 66, 18 and 19. Chicago Fair dedicated May 14, greatest number, so May 14, yes. Greatest number of devout men present. Their sacred year began April 16. 
So it begins April 18th. First month closes May 16th. Um, last, Joel 2, 23, people asleep. The love of Jesus, Joel 1, 14, Zephaniah 2, 1 to 3. Answer good or bad quick, right? So that's his. So why is he bringing up Joel 2, verse 23, and how is he understanding this verse? Well, I would suggest that um, he's talking about the earlier rain, which if Before. we're looking at, what's that? The former rain. Yeah, the former rain. Um, if we just if we look at that the way we look at it today, um, for their time, that was prior to uh, 1844, that, right? Well, he's talking about the former rain being Acts chapter 2. Right, oh, that's okay. devout men from all nations there. That's Acts chapter 2. Right. So so when he goes Isaiah 66, um, I know it's tough because he's doing a telegram, so he's not explaining himself very well. But Isaiah 66, verses 18 and 19. For I know their works and their thoughts shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and see my glory. And I will set a sign among them and I, I will send those that escape of them unto the nations to Tarshish. Pull and Lud that draw the bow to Tubal and Javan, to the isles afar off that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. So he's going to take this and apply it to Acts chapter 2, because he's referring to that. Um, though he doesn't mention the verse, but he's basically quoting it. And then he gives us this Isaiah 66, um, 18 and 19. Then he gives us this Joel 2. 23 so the Joel 2 23 that is um, the former and the latter reign in the first month now the way I believe that he's he's reading this is he's saying that this is the latter reign in this history right so what happened what's been happening in 1893 is the latter reign is being poured out God's people are asleep. We know that Ellen White says he's making a call to come out of the Adventist churches, right? The Adventist churches are now Babylon. He's calling people out of the Adventist churches. And, and he's using this that the church doesn't recognize that the latter rain has come, right? And, and people read this verse as the former and the latter rain both come in the first month, which is not what it's saying. It, there's the former rain, which happens in the winter. And there's the latter rain in the first month. Um, the former rain comes down moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month, right? Not both of them in the first month. Um, so we can see here that at the time that there is a true message, because Ellen White, when she talks about this, she says basically... Um, you need to be converted. You were there at the general conference and you, you needed to have that um, work done in your life. So here's it is again. <clears throat> Both these men, Brethren Stanton and Caldwell, were at the general conference. Could they not discern there the revelations of the Spirit of God? Could they not see that God was opening the window of heaven and pouring out a blessing. Testimonies had been given, correcting and counseling the church, and many had made a practical application of the message to the Laodicean church, confessing their sins and repenting in contrition of soul. They were hearing the voice of Jesus speaking to them. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will suck with him and he with me. Brethren Stanton and Caldwell had the same work of repentance and confession to do, thus clearing away the rubbish from the door of their own hearts and making a place for the heavenly guest. Had they placed themselves in the channel of light, they would have seen that the Lord was graciously manifesting himself to his people and that the Son of Righteousness had arisen upon them. The Council of Christ and the Laodicean Church was being acted upon. Those who felt their poverty were buying gold 
faith and love, white raiment, the righteousness of Christ, and I said, true spiritual discernment. Why did not these brethren place themselves in the channel of life? They were poverty stricken and knew it not. They were not working in Christ's lives. They were not softened and subdued by the Holy Spirit and were so blinded that they could not see the strong rays of light that were coming from the throne of God to his people. They heard not the voice of the true shepherd. They were listening to the voice of a stranger. Now, the thing is, we need to recognize this in ourselves, right? So we need to recognize that this work of repentance and confession has not been done. When we're comparing ourselves with others and see ourselves better than others, we're not doing this work. This work hasn't been accomplished in us. And so this work needs to be done. So... When we look at this history and we look at how we can get caught up, and I'm not saying Jones is getting caught up, but people can get caught up in the sins of others, we then don't recognize what our mission is. And our mission is to give a message to the world. And the only way we can do that is if Christ's character is seen upon us. Okay. Now, when the world's Congress of Religions comes and all these things are brought out, then we may expect we do not know how it will come. Right. So he's always clear about that. But we may expect controversies to arise out of that, that governmental recognition of religion. And from this day forward and everything that comes up, we may expect only the further development of the image that is already made. All that we can look for now is simply is just simply that in each step. And in everything that is done, other features will be developed, which more perfectly fill out the living, standing, full image of the beast. In all these things, it will come. And when the turmoils, the writings, and all the, all the evils that this thing engenders begin to be wrought and begin to come upon this nation, there will be an effort made to clear the government from it. There will be an effort made to rescue the government and free it from the evil that is being carried on through it. Persecutions will come. Oppressions will come from this more and more. And there will be a reaction. And if that reaction should lead to a governmental act that would, in its intent, swing the government clear back to the original prin principles of the Declaration and the Constitution, as I stated the other night, when that thing is done, it will be time for everyone to get ready to go at a moment's notice. That will be the time for everyone to increase his energies, deepen his consecration, and put himself and everything with all his might and main into the work. Because when that reaction itself reacts and the evil tide sways back again, as it surely will, into the religious persecuting, oppressing way, then it stays there. Now, so Jones, of course, isn't living in our day. But one of the things that he sees that we can quite see quite clearly is that this is about a reaction to whatever is happening, right? But things can happen very, very quickly. Just as we saw with Parminder's movement, how conservative Adventists who were part of this movement, it almost overnight turned a 180 in their belief systems regarding the Sunday law, regarding uh, what is what constitutes sin um, and um, departed from the faith, basically became woke themselves, uh, abandoned the health message, abandoned dress reform, um, basically abandoned. I don't even think they keep the Sabbath anymore, do they? Um I don't know because we don't have any contact with any of them. Oh, okay. okay. So, I mean, I've heard that, but I, I haven't. I mean, I know they accepted homosexuality and, and other things. Um, so, so I have no idea because they cut themselves off from all of us, right? So, and on their Facebook pages, they don't, uh, they, they're not allowed to communicate with any of us. So, 
um, and they don't seem to post much. Um, so yeah, it's hard to know. But but the point is that people can change quite drastically. And, and to me, that was a an object lesson in what can happen. That we can we can believe that we are Seventh Day Adventists, you know, and all of a sudden we can be on the side of the world completely because really we were on the world side. We don't have the care if we don't have the character, then we'll just you know. yeah. So just knowing what's going to happen, that's not going to save us, right? But you care, you got to have the character. So Jones goes on in Europe. This may be done twice. I will read a passage upon this from matter that never was published. It was given in a vision in 1850 and another in 1852. Brother Cornell had this and allowed us to copy it. He says that Brother O. Hewitt was president when the visions were given and secured these copies. Upon that point, this was said. So, <clears throat> so this is a statement um, from the Spirit of Prophecy. And he says it's from 1850. It was never published. I'm just going to, I just took a snippet from there and seeing if I can find it where. So it's March 26, 1893. Um, so this was uh, in the General Conference Bulletin. That's the source they have here. Um, and then um, it's also from Spalding and McGann collection. So that's where we would normally find it. Um, so in 2A. So Spalding and McGann, 2A, uh, paragraph 5. Spalding and McGann, 2. I guess it's just a copy of three early visions. <clears throat> so I saw in Europe, just as things were moving to accomplish their desires, there would seemingly be slacking up once or twice, see, would seemingly be slacking up once or twice, Thus, the hearts of the wicked would be relieved. Um, and here it says, ass lacking up. So that would make more sense grammatically. There would be seemingly be ass lacking up once or twice. Thus, the hearts of the wicked would be relieved and hardened. But the work would not settle down, only seem to. For the minds of kings and rulers were intent upon overthrowing each other and the minds of the people to get the ascendancy. So um, I'm just going to read this from Spalding again. So this, this section is called the nations. So I'm just going to give a bit more context. Thou wouldest not want him to step out if thou knewest thy situation. That desire is to disenthrone those kings, but that could not be for kings must reign till Christ begins to reign. Um, so that was the first sentence. Um, this, no, let me get back. I was trying to figure this out. What is she? Okay. So this is the vision where she says, I saw that the truth should be made plain upon tables, that the earth and the fullness thereof is the Lord's. I saw the two-horned beast had a dragon's mouth and the power was in his head, right? I saw nominal churches, the nominal church and nominal Adventists like Judas would betray us to the Catholics. Uh, um, so then it says, and, and that's from, so that's from a vision October 23rd. And this is another vision. So what she what she's saying here at the beginning Thou wouldest not want him to step out if thou knewest thy situation. I don't know the context there. But here, I'll show you what I'm looking at instead of looking at this. So, so here is the Spalding again. Uh, so there's three early visions. That's the first. And this is the second. And she's going to be, uh, Jones is going to quote this section from the vision. But there's a earlier sentence that I don't understand. Thou wouldest not want him to step out if he knew, if thou knewest thy situation. That desire is to disenthrone those kings, but that could not be, for kings must reign till Christ begins to reign. 
So I don't know what the context of this is. Anyway, I saw in Europe, just as things were moving to accomplish their desires, there would seemingly be a slacking up once or twice, as the hearts of the wicked would be relieved and hardened. But the work would not settle down, only seem to, for the minds of kings and rulers were intent on overthrowing each other in the minds of the people to get the ascendancy. I saw that all things are intensely looking and stretching their thoughts on the impending crisis before them. The sins of Israel must go to judgment beforehand. Every sin must be confessed at the sanctuary. Then the work will move. It must be done now. The remnant in the time of trouble will cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The latter rain is coming on those that are pure. All then will receive it as formerly. When the four angels let go, Christ will set up his kingdom. None will receive the latter rain, but those who are doing all they can. Christ would help us. All could be overcomers by the grace of God through the blood of Jesus. All heaven is interested in the work. Angels are interested. So anyway, that's a bit more of the context of what Jones is quoting from. Okay, so you can see, though it slacks up once or twice, it does not really. It only seems to. And it says that thus the hearts of the wicked will be relieved. Relieved of what? What had affected the hearts of the wicked? Why? The message telling them what these distresses mean. As the Lord has said, distress of, of nations. So I've got to go sharing back. Sorry about that. Here we go. <clears throat> uh, distress of nations. With perplexity. And the sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them for fear. And for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. They will be convinced by the spirit of God that this thing is so. And they will be afraid that it is. Not glad that it is so, but afraid it is. Then when it slacks up, that will relieve them, you see. Then they will say, we thought it was all a false alarm. We thought that was all a false, false alarm. And then when it swings back and the message goes on saying, that is what we told you, and now be sure to get ready. Then they will say, that's what you said before, and is slackened up and swung back. That is where the hardness of heart comes in. Just as Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and consequently the hearts of the wicked will be relieved and hardened. And when it does swing back, the end comes, and they are caught. Now about our own country, in 1888, when I went to the Senate, I had a hearing before the Senate committee. When I came back, Sister White asked me what the situation was there and what was the prospect. I told her what the senators told me, that that being a short session, Congress would expire on the 4th of March. But the session was so far gone that they would not possibly get the legislation through or could not possibly get the legislation through, even if it were introduced. From the calendar they had, they saw no possibility of its getting into the Senate even. And if it did, still there was no possibility that it could be passed and go through both houses, as it would have to. I told her the situation as it was. The answer she made was, then it is nearer than we expect. The natural thought would be, if it should not pass, then these things that we are looking for, troubles, persecutions, and so on, would be farther off. But if it should go through, then these things would be nearer. Well, as that would be the natural way to look at it. Of course, God's way being the right way and ours the wrong way. His is bound to be the opposite of ours. And what we would naturally think, the sign that it was farther off, would indeed be the sign that it was nearer. Well then, she went on to say that when this passed, when they get did get the government into their hands and begin their oppression and carry out the spirit that is in them, the oppressions and persecutions that will be set up will cause a reaction by men of fair minds who abhor persecutions, and there will be a lull and a little time of relief and apparent peace. And then, when the tide should swing back after the reaction, all things would wind up shortly. So you can see the situation here is similar to what we saw it would be in Europe, as expressed in this testimony of 1852. Uh, so that is why I said the other night that none of us wants 
want to get caught or deceived by anything that will be done hereafter, professing or expecting to undo what has been done. Whatever comes, bear in mind when it does come, it is only a little relief that God gives us in which to do more work than we ever did before in the world, and that it is it only opens up the way for us to do it in an easier way than we would have to do it, uh, to do. And so everyone that will take that view of it and who acts upon it, then when the work of God is finished, he simply goes in, unto the triumphant assembly on Mount Zion. But everyone that is saying, oh no, you were going too fast, you were making too much of this, as a good many will say, we want to be warned against these things also. Here's the record of what some will have to say. Now, we can see that Ellen White, even though she's in her time, she's speaking more for our time, right? Correct. Okay. When the watchman, seeing the sword coming, gives the trumpet a certain sound, the people along the line will echo the warning and all will have opportunity to make ready for the conflict. But too often, the leader has stood hesitating, seeming to say, let us not make too great haste. There may be a mistake. We must be careful not to raise a false alarm. The very hesitancy and uncertainty on his part is crying peace and safety. And don't you see in this that anyone who hesitates, anyone who wavers, his very conduct says peace and safety. He may not say it out loud, but he says it. And that is why in the other place we read in previous lessons, Caleb's are wanted who will say, now is the time for action. I read on. The very hesitancy and uncertainty on his part is crying peace and safety. Do not get excited. Be not alarmed. There is a great deal more made of this religious amendment question than is demanded. This agitation will all die down. See, that shows that some will say, well, some will say that. Well, then, don't you see those who say that and take that hesitating, lingering, questioning, wondering position, when they see something that appears like the undoing of all that has been done, they will say, yes, that's what we told you. We told you that long ago. But you have gone ahead and got the people all stirred up and alarmed, and now it is all undone. And what's your, what's your work worth? It is a false alarm that you have sent. You have deluded the people. It is no such thing, because when that law comes, that is the very thing that those who stand in the fear of God and in the counsel of God will see is their very grandest opportunity. Isn't it in answer to our prayers to hold the winds in check, someone asks? Yes, sir. And when that law comes, instead of saying peace and safety, everyone who stands in the counsel of God will exclaim, now get ready, quick. Get ready, for soon the tide will, tide will swing back. And then, everyone that is caught is caught forever. That is the danger you see. Let us read a little further from Great Controversy, page 443. When the early church became corrupted by departing from the simplicity of the gospel and accepting heathen rites and customs, she lost the spirit and power of God. And in order to control the consciences of the people, she sought the support of the secular power. That was the papacy, bear in mind, John says. Elmite right, goes on, the result was the papacy, a church that controlled the power of the state and employed it to further her own ends, especially for the punishment of heresy. In order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. Has anybody here seen anything of that kind done in the United States? Congregation, oh. yes. What's that? I was thinking of Waco. Mm. When you said that, I, I, I thought of Waco because of uh, their uh, the general conference's involvement with it. Yeah, okay. And, and well, and I would use, you know, more recent example is just uh, the church's complicity with, uh, you know, what happened in Russia with uh, uh, back in 2017 with the, the crackdown on 
uh, religious cults like Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh Day Adventists, and that the Adventist Church said we don't have anything to fear because we're complying, right? So, so think about that. But anyway, I know what you're talking about. Um, now, honestly, do you believe there is a person in this house besides yourself that has seen such a thing as that in the United States? Congregation, yes. Is there anyone that has not? Congregation, no. No difference what he says about it. No difference what he thinks about it or how he views it himself. Is there anyone in this house or in the United States that has not seen that thing? The question is not what he believes about it. That is not the question at all. But is there anyone that has not seen just that thing done? Congregation, no. There's not one that has not seen that thing done. They know it is done. Whether they allow it is the image of the beast or not, that is not the question. But it is done. They have seen it done. If anybody should say it is not the image of the beast, we can answer that it is something like it anyhow. We could go that far together, perhaps. And another thing that comes in right here, some have wished that they might have a statement by the Supreme Court of the United States as to what the court meant in that direction or that decision or as to what the court intended by it. But brethren, that would not do a bit of good. If the Supreme Court of the United States should write out as an express statement that the court did not mean at all to make this a Christian nation, that it did not intend at all to establish a national religion here, it would not affect the thing the thing, the snap at the snap of your finger. The question is not what the court intended. It is what the court has done. It is that that counts. And what the court has done will be seen and the fruit of it will be reaped and the effects of this will be carried on in spite of anything that the court even may have intended. That has nothing to do with it. I do not suppose that anyone in the court intended what is in what is uh, intended, what is in what the court said, because the court does not know what is in what it has said, and therefore it could not have intended what is in it. The court does not know what is in it. They do not dream what is in it. Did the Congress know that what was in the Sunday Act, closing the World's Fair on Sunday? Did they know what was in that? Congregation, no. Suppose Congress should rise up and pass a resolution for the nation. Uh, the American people saying, we did not intend at all by this act to put the government of the United States and the power of the government into the hands of the churches. And they could say so honestly. Don't you suppose they could? Question, did the bishops of Constantine's time know what was in back there? Answer, no. They did not see what was in it. They did not know what was in it. That is the point. So now if Congress should plainly say that we did not intend to give the government into the hands of the churches, and therefore the government is not in the hands of the churches, does the conclusion follow? No, it is there, whatever they intend. The point is, they do not know what is in it, and they themselves now know that there is in it what they, de they did not know was in it. A senator from the state of Washington told Brother Decker, but if he had known before what he knew afterward, he would not have voted as he did. Exactly. And members of the House have said the, the same thing. But there is the mischief of it. Satan does not care, and the papacy does not care whether they know what is in it or not, whether they intend it or not. It is done, and the fruits of it will appear, and the wrong that is in it will come, in spite of what the court intended, in spite of what Congress intended, in spite of what the court knew and in spite of what the Congress knew. And that is not where we are to look anyhow for interpretations of these things that have been done. In the word of God is where we are to look for the interpretation of these things that have been done. In the history of the papacy is where we are to look for the interpretation of these things that are done. And only those who do look there will be able to see, do look there, will be able to see what there is in these things which have been done. He who is not acquainted with the history of the papacy, he who has not studied that and seen the origin of these things and the encroachments and the building up and the logic of each step as it went on in its way until the final outcome, 
He who has not followed this will not be prepared to see what is in these things and what is to come out of them. Now, of course, we know the history of the papacy is in prophecy, right? So it's not just the, the history of the papacy but seen in, it, in its prophetic light. <clears throat> and therefore, the Lord has pointed us to that thing as the source of our knowledge. Let me read that again. To learn what the image is like and how it is to be formed. Just as I stated last night, God has given us things by which to know long beforehand what is going to be in order that when it appears, uh, we shall be able to recognize on the instant that the means that that means the papacy. Therefore, what the court intended in this is nothing at all to do with the question. And if a document could be secured from the Supreme Court of the United States, signed by every judge on the bench saying that they did not intend anything of that kind. I would simply say that it's not anything to do with the question. There is just what they said. They said that this is a Christian nation and proved it. And all this will come out of it in spite of anything ever they ever intended or ever knew, knew about it. That has nothing to do with it. And there are those testimonies we read here. All have them in our little special testimonies. There, is, there it is said that we are not to get our information from those without. We are not to take counsel with the world. Our orders are to come from above. Our counsel is to be received from there. In the Review and Herald of February 21st, first page, is a statement to the effect that those who stand in the counsels of God will have wisdom to detect Satan's movements and avoid them. Brethren, the Lord has left us armed at every point against every thing that Satan may do. Why, three distinct sources, you see, he has opened for our absolute knowledge of this thing. The Bible, the testimonies, and the history of the papacy. There are three sources of knowledge upon this. There's the history, there's the scripture, there's the spirit of prophecy to explain both. Has not he left us fully armed then? Well then, let us make use of the documents and means that he has given us by which to be fully armed against these deceptions. And that is what is wanted. It will require study, but what in the world is a preacher for if he is not to study? That is what I want to know. He has nothing else to do than to study, and nothing else to do than to work. Study and work, work and study all the time. Of course, it will be harder, harder work than a good many have done, to study up all these things and put your mind to it with, with all your might. But you need not be afraid of getting a brain fever. Do not be afraid of that. I just wish I would not confine it to ministers because all must be ministers one time or another. But I wish that every Seventh-day Adventist would get down to it and study until his brain fiber snaps. It would do him good. Study until his brain fairly cracks because of the exertion. What does the Lord say? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul. And how much of your mind? Congregation, all of it. And go at, go at it. Come along. Let us get at it. All of your mind is what he wants. All of your mind. All of it. It can happen. Now, one of the things I can say is when I began studying this message, I could study. I was always a studier. But in studying this message, the more I studied, uh, the more I exerted a mental effort to understand things, uh, the longer I could study, and, and the more I could have a concentrated, focused study. So, I mean, God can strengthen us uh, to study his word. I will read that statement a little further concerning those who say it will all die down. Testimony number three. 33 pages, 243, 244. Too often the leader has stood hesitating, seeming to say, let us not be too great in too great haste. There may be a mistake. We must be careful not to raise a false alarm. The very hesitancy and uncertainty on his part is crying peace and safety. Do not be excited. Do not be alarmed. There is a great deal more made of this religious amendment question than is demanded. This agitation will die down. Right? So that's what the person says. Thus, he virtually denies the message sent from God and the warning which was designed to stir the churches 
fails to do its work. The trumpet of the watchman gives no, no certain sound, and the people do not prepare for the battle. Let the watchman beware, lest through his hesitancy and delay, so shall be left to perish, and their blood shall be required at his hand. Then another thing, some of the ministering brethren, and a good many of the people have said, I do not think this religious liberty work, this church work and state work is quite the thing. It's too much like politics. I do not think it is exactly the thing to work in the church and on the Sabbath and so on. Well, that depends altogether on what the condition of your heart is. It depends altogether on what it is to you. If it is simply a political thing to you, then all it is to you is politics. If it is a religious liberty work indeed with you and in you, then it is the gospel. If it is with you only in theory, only in outward formalism, then all it is with you is politics. Policy is all you know. But if it is with you and in you, the real soul liberty, the real liberty that Christ gives the converted soul, then it is religious liberty indeed, the gospel of Christ. And no politics about it. That is the difference between politics and the gospel of Christ. I would like to know who is the greatest, the sharpest, and the most tricky politician on the earth. Congregation, the Pope of Rome. Of course, the Pope. He always has been the greatest politician. Every one of them has been a politician. In that way. But he professes the gospel. And where is there a broader professor of religion than the Pope? But the principles of the papacy and the gospel, as professed by the papacy, are all on the outside. It never can be anything but politics. But let the principles of the gospel that these men put on the outside only, and which they simply hold as a theory, as a creed, let these principles of the gospel reach the heart and bring Jesus Christ into the heart. And then you have got religious liberty indeed. But there would then be no popes. And so those brethren that have supposed that the religious liberty work was too much like politics for them, what they need is to find out what religious liberty is and to get religious liberty for themselves and in their hearts. And then they will know it is not politics. They will know that it is religion. Those folks have not found out what real religion is. No, sir. The man who finds the religious, the religious liberty that there is in Jesus Christ and which the gospel brings to him and which separates every religious thing from the state separates church and state. The man who does that, he knows that it is not politics because, he's, because he knows the straight way and he will take the straight way and he will go that way in the face of every consideration that the earth can furnish or mention. There's no politics in that. That is principle. Well then, this is where we stand. These are some of the things we are to consider and the secret of all the beginning and ending of all, the all in all of it, is simply Jesus Christ in a man, the hope of glory that explains everything, that gives understanding of everything, it supplies everything, Christ, Christ in him crucified. That is all that any man wants. That is all that any man needs. It is all we can have, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and we are complete in him. For ye are complete in him. Then as we separate, going forth to carry the message which God has given us, and the power which he has given with it, the everlasting gospel to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And do not forget, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. With the other angel following, saying Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of her wrath, of her fornication. Has she? All nations now? Congregation, yes. Then let the still louder voice go. If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Well then, when one of your friends dies, why do you mourn? 
God has promised a blessing upon you. Do not rob yourself of a blessing too by unbelief. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. And then it is confirmed, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works to follow them. And I looked and behold a white cloud upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy seat sickle and reap. For the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. That is where we are going. It is a straight journey right through. That is where it is. Well, then, don't you see that everything we do Every subject we take, every word we utter is in view of the coming of the Lord. He is coming. He is coming. Are you not glad of it? Yes, the Lord is coming himself, and we shall see him as he is, not as he was, but as he is. His face shining as the sun, his raiment white as the light, his voice like the voice of a multitude, speaking peace and everlasting joy to those who wait for him. Yes, brethren, he is coming all over glorious. He is coming. We shall see him. We shall see him. Yes, like that blessed hymn which says, he comes not an infant in a Bethlehem born. He comes not to lie in a manger. He comes not again to be treated with scorn. He comes not as a shelterless stranger. He comes not to Gethsemane to weep, and sweat blood in the garden. He comes not to die on the tree, to purchase for rebels a pardon. Oh no, glory bright glory environs him now. Exactly, wrapped in a blaze of boundless glory, it is. How many of the holy angels with him? Congregation, all of them. All of them? Congregation, every one. But shall we know him then amongst such a company of them, each one shining above the brightness of the sun? Our brethren, he who has gone with us all the way, he who has been with us in suffering, he who has been with us in sorrow, he who has delivered us from trouble, he who has walked with us all the way, he who has walked with us all the, all the way, he who has saved us from our sins, he who has made us acquainted with him. Can anything obscure him? in that, that day and hide him from us? Congregation, no. No. That blessed presence that has bound us to him when he was so far away, can anything keep us from him when he comes so near? No. And the 10,000 times, 10,000 and thousands of thousands of angels are not there to keep us from him. They are not there to surround him like a bodyguard of soldiers to keep people away. No, they come to take us to him, congregation, amen. And that is the only thing they are there for, to bring us to him. And he will take us to himself, for he says so. He says so, and we shall see him for ourselves, and our eyes shall behold him, and not a stranger. No, not a stranger. The last words of Paul were, O Lord, when shall I embrace thee? When shall I behold thee for myself without a dimming veil between? Sketches from the of Paul, page 331. Can't we all say it too? <clears throat> Brethren, it will not be long. Voices. No, indeed. It will not be long. Why well, think? More than that, we shall see all the rest there. And did you ever notice that turn that is taken in Paul's words? There, when he is comforting us about the loss of our friends who have died, that they will all come from the dead again, 1 Thessalonians 4. Now let us read that. But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, which ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. 
and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with one another, congregation, with the Lord. Why, he started out to tell them that they would meet with their dead friends after a while. But when he came to the time, he did not see them at all. What is the reason? Because the Lord is all in all that day. Why, of course, we will be glad our friends are all there. The brethren, we will be gladder than all that that friend himself is there. He takes precedence of all our other friends in that day. We're so glad that that friend is there that we have not time to look for these. And so he says, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. <clears throat> and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Brethren, then there will be no dimming veil between. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And let us be glad. Let us be glad all the way. Tell the people that the Lord is coming. Tell them, get ready, for he is coming. Tell them these things. Say, his coming is near. Get ready, for he is coming. Get ready to meet him, for he is coming. Get ready to be like him. For that glory of which he has given us a part now will make us like him altogether in that day. And then he says, where's that hymn book? Let us sing that piece, 1175, in the resurrection morning. And we're not going to sing that right now, but that's what he does. They sing this hymn. And, uh, of course, that's ending, I believe, the general conference in 1893. So hopefully people receive the blessing from this study. It's, it's, it's a rather complicated one in some ways. Some ways I feel it's kind of incomplete, um, what Jones presents. But as I said, next week we're going to go over some of the history regarding 1895 and deal with the 1895 General Conference Bulletin um, as we go forward. A any final thoughts in what we've read? Any observations? <clears throat> oh, but it put you to sleep with my reading. But okay, no, I've been practicing to stay up for you guys. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, let's uh, let's close with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for the words of Scripture, for your Holy Spirit that speaks to us and gives these words meaning and significance in our lives. We are thankful that um, you've been gracious to lead us, to call us out of the world into the kingdom of your marvelous light. We are thankful for this Sabbath. Help it to be a blessing to each one of us. We can enter into your rest. Thank you for each person who is searching, for those that watch these videos, those that participate. We just ask, Lord, that you can use us um, individually and in our combined effort um, to reach those who are in darkness. Be with us throughout the Sabbath, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.